When I was pregnant with my first child, I worked the overnight shift at a gas station near my house to pick up some extra hours. I know this may not sound amazing, but this gas station was beautiful. It was one of those full market gas stations and in a really nice section of town. I know most stories that take place in these sorts of 24-hour settings are usually in dark and eerie places, but I never once felt that way about this location. Usually, after 11 o'clock at night, it was slow. I would spend most of my shift watching YouTube or Netflix on my phone, talking to my fiancé or stocking all the shelves. There weren't even all that many overnight truck drivers buying coffee or snacks or anything. The gas station wasn't that close to any nearby highways. It was an easy job, especially being pregnant, and it paid quite well, which was the main reason I had this job. One night early in my shift, a taller man came in. I called out from behind the counter, Hey there, how you doing this evening? The man didn't respond, didn't even look in my direction. He just walked straight into the bathroom. That wasn't alarming to me though. If I'm being honest, I knew better than most at this point that you kinda gotta go when you gotta go. I just figured he really had to go badly to the bathroom. After nearly 20 minutes had passed though, I realized they had never come out. I was a little bit concerned and was thinking about knocking on the door to make sure he was alright. I slowly started making my way to the bathroom and saw he had finally come out. I got a good look at his face at this point. He was normal looking as could be, clean shaven with a tan complexion. He had short gray hair that was parted and combed nicely. Even though his hair was gray, he couldn't have been older than 40 years old. He was wearing jeans, a flannel, and work boots that looked really beat up. I got the impression this guy must be some kind of blue collar worker and was just stopping in to use the restroom. He walked right by me again and didn't say a single word. He walked outside, but didn't get into any vehicle. He looked like he walked to the side of the building. That's when I noticed there were no vehicles out there whatsoever. Whoever this strange man was, he must have walked the entire way here. That ordeal was a little bit off-putting, but overall I stopped thinking about it just a couple of minutes later. It was an uneventful part of working these late night shifts. You get your array of strange individuals, and usually nothing ever comes of it. As the night continued, I ended up calling my fiancé. We were talking on the phone, passing the time. It had to be at least an hour later. The door opened, and to my surprise, it was the same guy. I didn't say anything to him, figuring that maybe he spoke another language or something. Well, that theory went out the window instantly, because instead of walking to the bathroom this time, he walked right up to the counter and asked me in a very polite voice, Hello, ma'am. You can say hello to me now. He smiled as he said it, indicating to me that he was joking around. I nervously smiled. Sorry about that, sir. Hello. How are you doing this evening? He smiled and only responded with one word in an abrupt tone. Jerky. I jumped back a little bit and said, Excuse me? The man then leaned in toward me, and his polite voice changed into a more aggressive tone. I want beef jerky. Where is it? I pointed over to the rack where all the jerky and Slim Jims were located. He smiled at me, and now in a polite tone once again, he said, I thank you, ma'am. He slowly walked over to the beef jerky and stopped once he got to the rack. He was standing completely still when he said to me, You know, you look just like a Disney princess. I was a bit creeped out, but said thank you anyway, figuring he was just trying to be nice. I look like a lot of things, sure, but one thing I definitely do not look like is a Disney princess, trust me. Without grabbing any of the jerky, he marched back over to the counter and started to stare at me. I know staring on its own is harmless, but this stare was so intrusive and made me incredibly uncomfortable. His eyes were flying around like ping pong balls. Yeah, that's it, Disney princess. See it now? I gave a little half smirk, but apparently that wasn't good enough for this man. He started to shout, and I mean quite literally starting to scream. What, you don't like Disney? 
I didn't even have time to respond before he started to shout again. My daughter used to like Disney, and now she's just like you. I started to gather that clearly this man was not right in the head. I had no idea what that statement was even supposed to mean. His daughter is just like me? As calmly as I could, I said, I'm sorry if I offended you. I'm just... He cut me off and started to scream uncontrollably. At this point, he wasn't even saying anything that made any sense at all. It was just a lot of gibberish and nonsense. Saying things like, Instead of princess, you all want to be heroes. And even more strangely, I could be a king, and instead I'm here. It was clear to me that this man was having some sort of breakdown. Thankfully, I'd never hung up on the phone with my fiancé, who was witnessing this entire unhinged conversation. He felt like something was clearly not right, and he didn't want to take any chances. He called the police and told them I was dealing with an unhinged, unruly, and potentially hostile customer. Well, I've never been more thankful for my fiancé, because during the man's rant, he did indeed start becoming hostile. He stormed back over to the beef jerky and knocked over the entire display. Even though this guy was clearly not right, this was the first moment I actually felt physically unsafe. After knocking over the display, he turned and looked at me. His eyes were almost indescribable. They looked void of any emotion. In that moment, two cop cars pulled up, but the man didn't even flinch. He just stood over by the rack and continued to stare at me. The cops walked inside, and to their credit, they didn't overreact at all. They remained very cool. One of the officers came to me and made sure I was alright, which I was. The other officer went over to the man and was talking to him quietly. I couldn't make out any of the words the cop was saying to him, but the man looked very upset. He didn't lose his temper as he did moments ago, though. The officers escorted him out, not in handcuffs or anything. Literally just walked him outside and had a conversation. It lasted a good 20 minutes or so. One officer left with the man with the other hanging around at the gas station with me, making sure the man did not attempt to come back. I have no idea what would have happened if my fiancé wasn't still on the phone and called the police. The man was becoming more and more enraged with every moment that passed by. I never saw the guy again and I never placed any official report really after this night. I didn't work another overnight shift. I know some people may have had far worse and more terrifying stories of working overnight. I truly do feel for those people. However, this was the worst thing that ever happened to me personally, and even though I was left with no physical harm, the fear I felt that evening, looking into the eyes of this crazed man, is something that will always be burned into my brain. Anybody who's ever worked at a fast food restaurant overnight knows just how unique some patrons can be. To add another variable to this already great combination, I worked at a 24-hour McDonald's that was directly off an exit. It was a frequent stop for truckers, cops, drunks, and anybody looking to get hot food in the middle of the night. As you would expect, I met countless characters I could describe. I could write a book about every strange and unique human being I met while working at that job. I've even had some wild experiences with people who decided to have an all-out brawl right in the middle of the restaurant. But none of those experiences were as scary or crazy to witness as this one. I guess only once in the two years I worked at that restaurant did I really experience something that horrified me. It started like most nights that I did the overnight shift. I got there at 10 and it was extremely slow. It was always really slow at that time. Then you would get a rush from about 11.30pm to 1.30am. Then, depending on the day, it would be very sporadic throughout the night. On this night, I was hoping for a slower night. It was just one of those days where I was not really feeling it at all. My car wouldn't start in the morning, my husband tried to figure it out, but unfortunately cars aren't his strong suit, so therefore I was left without a vehicle. On top of that, I felt under the weather. It happens to me every fall season, 
I felt like a house was crushing down on me. I just wanted to climb under a blanket and pass out, but unfortunately, I got bills to pay. Unless I was extremely sick, calling in was not really an option. Thankfully, I was able to take my husband's Silverado truck to work. A little after 2 a.m., my coworker and I were just hanging out. I ended up getting my wish with it being slow that night. It was one of the slowest nights I could ever remember working. My coworker went into the office to do some paperwork. I think that was really an excuse to go take a nap or something though. I didn't have the energy to call him out on it. When I was alone at the counter listening to YouTube on my phone, I heard the bell for the door ring. It was a peculiar looking man walking inside. He wasn't an old man but he wasn't exactly young either. Maybe mid-forties if I had to guess. He looked homeless, but not grungy or dirty. More like he was just not put together right. He was shorter than me, but I'm fairly tall for a woman. He couldn't have weighed more than 130 pounds. As he slowly approached the counter, I called out to him. Hey there, sir. What can I get you tonight? He just looked at me and smiled. I wish I could have a picture of that moment. The look he was giving me as he smiled made me so unsettled. Something about the way he was looking at me was just not right. It gave me the creeps before he even spoke. His eyes were so dark they almost looked black, and his mouth was just open enough with a smile that I could see his yellow teeth. Finally, he spoke after what seemed like an outrageous amount of time. I was surprised at the deep southern voice that came out of this little man. Wow, aren't you gorgeous? I thought I wanted fries, but maybe I'll order something else. Yeah, I know, that's weird and creepy, but working this graveyard shift at a restaurant that gets a lot of customers who are under the influence, I'm used to weird attempts at flirting. I just smiled and said very politely, Okay, sir, well, when you know what you want, just let me know now. The man grinned from ear to ear, flashing his full set of yellow and gray teeth. He slapped his hands down on the counter, and all I could see were his long, dirty fingernails. I tried not to look visibly disgusted. He spoke up again. Forget the fries. What time are you done? Usually, something like this, I would just smile and say I'm married and move on with my life. I don't know if it was because I didn't feel good, or maybe because this guy gave me the creeps from the start. Instead, in an annoyed and aggressive voice, I responded with, if you don't want to order any food, you can leave right now. The man just started to laugh, as if I just told him a real great joke. Before I said or did something I would come to regret, I turned around and started knocking on the office door. When my coworker opened the door, he could tell I was visibly shaken. I told him about this creepy guy, who was clearly in sight. He smirked because he knew right away what I was dealing with. He told me to go take a break and that he would take care of this guy. Without even thinking or looking back, I grabbed my coat and went outside and sat in my husband's truck for 15 minutes. I just listened to some music. I'd almost forgotten about that creep up until right before I went back inside. I noticed him wandering on the far side of the parking lot with a to-go bag in his hands. I was relieved my coworker was able to get rid of him peacefully. I decided to wait in the truck for another five minutes just in case. I didn't want this creep to know which vehicle was mine. When I finally went back inside, my coworker looked more than a little bit freaked out. I asked him about his interaction with that freak, and his answer freaked me out even more. He said in a tentative voice, I don't know if I should tell you. I started to jokingly hit his arm, and I told him to tell me what happened, to which he complied. He said the guy was absolutely crazy. When I came out to take his order, he just kept asking where the girl was, so I told him you went home for the night. He started losing his mind, screaming and swearing. I ended up just giving him a free medium fries just to shut him up and get him out of here. Then he turned around as he was walking out and said, Tell Monica I said goodbye, and I'll see her soon. This little story almost made me faint, mainly because I don't even wear a name tag at this job. I have no earthly idea how this man could possibly know my name. For the remainder of the shift, I couldn't focus. I just kept looking over at the door expecting this man to stumble back in, but thankfully he never did. 
Close to 4.30 in the morning, I asked if I could leave early. He knew I wasn't feeling well, especially with that creepy guy in mind. He knew I needed to get away, just to make my night a little bit enjoyable. As I was leaving, it started to snow. It was the first truly hard snowfall of the season, even though fall had basically just started. I was thankful to have my husband's truck once again. I figured if I took it slow, I'd be safe. I couldn't have been more wrong. Only about a half mile from work, I ended up sliding into a ditch because I couldn't see the road from all the snow falling. It was alright, it didn't seem like too much damage was done, but of course I couldn't get myself out of the ditch by myself. I called the police and surprisingly the cops were there in only a minute. I got out of the truck to greet the cops, and that's when it happened. From the bed of the truck, the man from the restaurant jumped out and started to run full speed into the night. I screamed and was at a loss for words. The cops didn't know what to do and started to yell at me to tell them what was going on. I told him and he radioed some other cops, but they never caught the man. We eventually went back to the restaurant. I gave the police my entire story. They looked at the cameras, but it wasn't enough to ever actually catch the guy. The worst part was watching the video of the man climbing into the bed of my truck to hide. It was no more than 10 minutes after my break had ended. He'd come storming back into the parking lot with his food bag still in his hands. He looked around for a few minutes, tried all the doors, and when he realized it was locked, he jumped into the back. I'm so lucky I drove into a ditch that night, because if I hadn't, who knows what would have happened to me. The bag was left in the back of the truck with the fries still inside. This guy never even wanted the food. He knew my name from the start. He knew when I worked. And he knew my exact vehicle I would have. This happened several years ago, and I'm still not quite ready to work overnights again. Always lock your doors, and please be careful. Some people really are monsters. I'm a detective, but not like the ones you'd see on TV and in the movies. I'm more of a private detective. By that, I mean I don't get involved in any murder cases or anything like that. Most people hire me for family affairs. I get a lot of work from investigating cheating accusations or locating missing or stolen pets. I'm sometimes asked to gather evidence of bullying at schools as well. I had a call one afternoon last summer, and I've told some of my friends about this experience. They've encouraged me to share it. It's the strangest and frankly most disturbing case I've ever handled. So I got a call from a client who was a woman in her 30s. She made arrangements to meet me in person to speak to me about her request. I was taken aback by her beauty when I first laid eyes on her. She was a very, very talkative woman. It was as if her tongue was afraid of the dark or something. She was very warm and open, and she had come to ask me to find out if her husband was having an affair. I thought to myself, now who the hell would want to cheat on this woman? She had grown suspicious of her husband, though. He had started coming home later and later from work. She guessed he was meeting up with someone, based on how shifty he had been acting. Whenever she asked him where he had been, he'd just brush her off. She thought he had been cheating on her for about a month or so. I took the job and told her I would trail him when he finished work. I got to his work address and waited in my car until I saw him leave. I was honestly hoping this guy was just trying to put in a few extra hours for his wife and potentially their future. You never want to see anyone actually cheating. But, as in most cases in my line of work, I was wrong. The husband left work at about 6 p.m. His wife told me he had been coming home no earlier than 10, though. So clearly, he was up to something during those four extra hours, and I was going to find out what that something was. He got into his car, and I tailed him. We drove for quite a while. We left the city area and headed out into the suburbs. I thought to myself he might have met a woman in the city who lived on the outskirts, and to avoid their affair being discovered, he'd meet her out here and never in the city. My theory immediately went out the window, though, when we drove right through the suburbs as well and out into the countryside. 
Now, this wasn't what I was expecting at all. I was quite surprised at this point. There wasn't really anything out there where we were heading. Nothing but a few houses and a couple of abandoned buildings. He led me to the most unexpected place, an abandoned love hotel. He parked up and I turned off my car as to not raise his suspicions. I planned on looping back around to covertly see what he was getting up to. While doing this, I did a search on this abandoned love hotel. Apparently, it went under due to poor management quite a long time ago. I found online that it had closed more than 10 years ago, so what the hell was he doing out there if the hotel was no longer open? If it was still operating, that would be fine. I guess love hotels are kind of self-explanatory. You know, you rent a room for a certain period of time and you get intimate in that room. It's a pretty straightforward thing. A lot of love hotels are so out there and unusual though. They offer all kinds of fulfillments of fantasies. If you want to do it in a themed room like a medieval Game of Thrones kind of scenario, there's definitely a hotel for that. This particular one was catered to all kinds of fantasies. I could just tell by some of the reviews that it really seemed as if nothing was off the table. That said, this place was abandoned, so what exactly was he doing here? I had to pull in and see for myself. I still had a job to do no matter how strange this was. I had to observe and report what was going on. I quietly headed in to the abandoned hotel and cautiously walked into the lobby, trying my best to avoid all the debris on the floor. It didn't take long for me to locate which room he was in. I heard strange noises coming from upstairs. A male voice was murmuring, so I followed the sound of those murmurs and I arrived at the room. I could see and hear what was going on through a gap in the door. The man had left it slightly ajar. I peeked inside, and what I saw rendered me speechless. Oh, look at you. You're so beautiful and lovely, and quiet, nice and quiet. The husband was speaking to a naked woman, who was lying on the dusty bedspread. The husband began to take off his suit jacket and started loosening his tie. I was almost certain about what was to come next, and I couldn't bear watching that. I was very confused and conflicted. I had to report this to my client, and I knew it was going to be very difficult and likely distressing for the wife. Her reaction and her feelings towards what happened will remain confidential. All I'll say is that my predictions were correct. It was incredibly distressing. I don't know anything about how he explained himself or what motive was behind him doing that. I've thought about it a lot. When I told one of my friends this story, well, she's into creepy online stuff, so you can thank her for me sharing this with you. This happened when I was a student. I had a part-time job in a restaurant. The restaurant closed each night at 3 a.m. I was living in a student city, and by that I mean there was no shortage of students looking for part-time work. I guess you could say I was lucky to have a job at all. One thing about living in such a city is that when it's Oban, everyone heads home. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Oban, so let me explain it quickly. Oban is an annual Buddhist event for commemorating one's ancestors. It's believed that each year during Oban, the ancestors' spirits return to this world in order to visit their relatives. It's mainly observed from August 13th to 16th. The Oban week in mid-August is one of Japan's three major holiday seasons. Pretty much all of the student workers were eager to either head home and see their families or simply have some time off for the Oban holidays. I was happy to keep working though. I needed that money. The working rotation would go like this. One full-time worker and two part-time workers would work most of the night shifts at the restaurant, and that was the same during Oban. The restaurant was in the middle of a row of houses. It was renovated property. That means the houses were detached and not next to the restaurant. That would have been pretty annoying for the residents if that was the case. The second floor of the restaurant wasn't used for customers. It was used as a storage room where we kept equipment and supplies. There were some odd things up there. 
I don't know if this stuff belonged to the owner of the store, but there were family photos and a Buddhist altar as well. I never liked going up there at night. When I was sent to get supplies, it really creeped me out. The following incident happened on the 13th of August last year. It was the night before Oban officially began. Just into the early hours of the actual day, I'll never forget it. It had been a busy night. I was just about to finish my shift. I left the building to turn off the outdoor lighting in front of the restaurant. There was a motion sensor light above the door, so when a customer walked through, it made a ping-pong sound that alerted us workers. When I came back inside, I started to clean the floor in the kitchen, hoping we were done for the night. The other employees were back there in the kitchen with me, and they were cleaning down too. I heard the door sensor go off. I wondered if a customer had just walked through those doors, even though we were about to close. I called out a welcome as a kind of knee-jerk reaction. It was what we had to do every time a customer came through those doors. I went to look and see who was coming through. I was surprised to see that there was no one there. All the lights at the front of the store were off and it was 3 a.m. now. We didn't usually have customers at that time of night. It was odd. The full-time employee came out from the back and I looked over to him. He said, customer? I walked back towards him in the kitchen and said, no. Actually, I could tell he was thinking the same thoughts I was. Then why had we just heard the entrance chime? We looked at one another in silence for a few moments. Then we heard a loud noise coming from the back of the store. It sounded as if something very heavy had just dropped or slammed. Naturally, the last couple of events had creeped us out a bit. Someone was out there messing with us. We went to look out back, but we didn't see anything out there either. There was no one at all. I guessed it might have been a stray cat knocking something off a high place outside. It had happened before, but this was Oban, and my head slowly started to fill itself with legends and ghost stories, the kind of stuff I had heard from a young age. The dead spirits returning. The logical part of my brain told me it was nothing but a coincidence, and I needed to hurry up and finish my shift. I was thinking a lot of things I can't really remember. It's been a year since this happened. We got fully cleaned down and got everything we needed to do done. Last year, I hadn't worked around this time because I went home to see my family. One of the part-time employees told me something like this happened the year before, too. I wondered if he was trying to purposely scare me or prank me. As we were chatting, I felt as if they were just about to tell me last year what happened, but they were interrupted by the sound of the sensor under the door ping-ponging again. This couldn't be real. This time I didn't say a welcome, I just looked over at the dark entrance. Once again, there was no one there. It was starting to get scary at this point. It was as if something was there, but we just couldn't see it. It almost made me feel like something was watching me, right out of the darkness outside. I didn't think my colleagues were pranking me anymore. I just wanted to leave and go home. Thankfully, I did, without any further spooky happenings going on. I worked the night shift a few times after that, and nothing similar ever happened again. Well, the sensor at the entrance did malfunction a couple of times, but I feel like what happened on Oban was a bit different. I guess it probably doesn't sound as creepy as it was, but in those moments in the dark, with something close by that we couldn't see, I was absolutely terrified. The story I'm going to share took place a little over 11 years ago. At the time, I was a nurse at one of our local hospitals and working primarily in the cardiology floor. I was a relatively new employee at this facility, so I was taking pretty much any shift I could get. A lot of my shifts were overnight shifts, or shifts that started in the late afternoon and went through the middle of the night because of this. At the time, I didn't really mind, but looking back on it now, I have no idea how I wasn't in bed by 10pm every night like I am nowadays. There are probably a thousand experiences I've had throughout my career that would make for an interesting story, but there's one that sticks out more than any of the others and still bothers me to this day. 
On the cardiac floors, we allow different visitation rules than some of our other floors. Due to the sometimes unexpected and catastrophic nature of the illnesses, it wouldn't be uncommon to have visitors get approved to stay a majority of the day or night. If a spouse had just experienced a heart attack, it was natural to have someone stay the entire night, even if they had been stabilized and moved to another floor. There was one particular patient who had their spouse with them for two or three days as they recovered and worked to get discharged and released home. They were both very nice people, especially my patient, who still remains one of the sweetest people I'd ever met. Her husband, who was nice enough even from the beginning, seemed to have something a little bit off. I remember the wide smile he would have when talking to me or my co-workers. At first, it seemed kind and inviting, but after holding a few minutes of conversation, it got kind of uncomfortable. Anyway, the first occurrence happened on the second night of the stay. I was working an overnight shift, and it was later in the evening. I was at the nurse's station when I saw the light flashing outside the patient's room. That alerted me that they had used the call button to request something. I made my way to the room and went in to check and see what was going on. When I got there, all the lights were off, but the TV was still on. The patient looked to be deep asleep. I was kind of confused. Maybe the patient had accidentally hit it in their sleep. Then I heard someone whisper, Smells good right into my ear. I jumped and kind of shrieked. I saw it was the patient's husband. He said, oh, it was just me playing a little joke and hiding in the bathroom. He stammered on further. Yeah, sorry, your hair smells really good. I just kind of stood there in silence for a second and replied, uh, please let me know if there's anything else then. If either of you need anything, just use the call button. If you guys actually need assistance, though, not for any random thing. I left the room and went back to the nurse's station, which sat directly across from the bank of elevators. The location was very annoying, because the old elevators made a loud noise when they went up or down. A few hours had passed, and the elevator was making its oh-so-lovely sounds again. It dinged open to the doors on our floor. I looked around the desk, but no one was there. The doors closed and the elevator went right back down. That was weird. Well, this happened five more times in a row. I decided finally to see who was messing around and calling or sending the elevator back and forth. I got into the elevator and went down to the second floor where the doors opened again. There was no one there. Being annoyed, tired, and confused at this point, I went back up to my floor to head back to my desk. When it got back up, the elevator had thankfully stopped its constant noise and movement. However, when I reached for my cup of water, I noticed a folded up piece of paper. I thought maybe it was something I had left there. Maybe something I wrote down that I didn't want to forget to do or something. When I unfolded it though, it said, For my favorite nurse. It was a small drawing of a rose or something. I set it down and looked around to see if anyone was there. I didn't see anyone outside of another nurse, though, who was all the way at the other end of the hallway, coming out of a different room. Thankfully, I was able to keep myself busy for the rest of the night, and it was almost time for me to hand off my patients to the next shift. As I was finishing some paperwork, I felt a feeling like someone was behind me, or I was being watched very closely. I sat up in my chair and kind of looked around. I saw a head barely poking out of the doorway of a patient's room. Yeah, it was the smells good person from earlier in the night. As soon as he saw my gaze going that way, he popped his head back inside the doorway. I angled my chair so I could see that room, but it still looked like my head was facing my computer. Every so often, I would see a head pop out of the doorway, then dart back into the room. I tried to ignore it as best I could so I could finish my shift and go home and get some much needed sleep. I did just that and returned to work the next day to find that patient from that room had indeed been discharged. I was getting my new assignments when one of my colleagues said, I heard you made a new friend last night. I asked what they meant. She said, one of your patients got discharged today. One of their family members were looking for you and asking for you, wanted to see if you were here. 
We told them you were gone and we didn't know when your next shift was. When we told them you weren't here, his face went from a smile to a frown and he just walked away. We figured he made a good impression or something. I just smiled at my coworker and went back to reviewing some charts. I will say that things always seem a little more unnerving on the night shift. I've always wondered if that's our subconscious at work or if weird things really do occur more at night. This is the first time I'm trying to share this story, other than with the police the night of the incident. I guess you could technically argue I have no real reason to be as freaked out as I am, since nothing really happened to me, but mentally I'm still scarred. The terror I felt in that moment is something that still shakes me to my very core. I used to work for a service that would go to various businesses and clean, mop, and wax the floors. As you may expect, this type of work may be tough when there are workers or customers walking around. Because of that, the company works in the middle of the night so as to not disturb any of the businesses. I personally only work for this company once a week for some extra money. I was saving for a house with my soon-to-be wife. The business was great, but getting help was not. It got to a point where the owner would send all of us to different business locations to basically work alone. That was unless it was a big business or a hospital or something that you couldn't reasonably be expected to do by yourself. This specific night I was alone, which I really didn't mind all that much. I put my headphones in and got to work on the floors. It was really mindless work, which was great for me because that made it easy money. In the town where I lived, there's a small grocery store that's popular amongst the locals. This store is one of our clients. I would usually tackle this entire store by myself about once a month or so. The night started just like every other night. I started with my sweep and then got ready to mop the floors with the machinery. Every so often when doing the floors, you have to go back and empty the machine which is filled with water. While I was draining the hose, I thought I saw something out of the corner of my eye, moving around on the sales floor. I knew nobody was supposed to be in the store right now, so I figured my mind must just be playing tricks on me. Maybe my boss had showed up or something. Neither of those were that unlikely. I paused my music and took my headphones out for a minute. I set my phone and headphones on the counter next to where I was disposing of the water. I slowly walked back out there and walked around for a minute to see if I could see anything. I walked to the front end of the store and just as I was getting ready to head back to the floor machine, I heard voices. I froze in place for a moment, trying to process what was going on here. Then, seconds later, I realized that these were not voices I was supposed to be hearing. Without thinking, I jumped into one of those little cashier's nooks and stayed hidden. There were at least two men that I could hear. They were arguing about something just bickering back and forth. One of the voices sounded like an older, perhaps middle-aged man. The other voice I heard was definitely that of a younger man, maybe in his 20s or so. I stayed in that cashier's nook, laying in a fetal position, just hoping that whatever was happening was not that serious. The men sounded like they were standing nearby to the cash register I was hiding behind. The older man said to the younger man, Okay, you got the information? Let's get it and get out of here. I heard them walking away, and that's when I grabbed my first glimpse of the intruders. I was able to confirm it was indeed just two men. One of them was freakishly large, and the other man was what you probably may consider to be average size. They were at the customer desk, trying to open what I assumed was a safe or small vault of some kind. At least from where I was, it looked like a safe of some sort. The younger guy was trying to crack it open, while the older guy was harassing him, saying things like, Hurry up or I'll knock you out! Even crazier and equally disturbing threats. That's when I noticed the most scary thing. Both these men had loaded weapons, like real actual guns. They both had several weapons in their waistband, in fact. I didn't dare test these men to see if they knew how to use them. 
My first instinct was to call the police, but my phone was still in the back with the floor machine. I decided the best and most efficient course of action was to stay hidden. If I hid, hopefully this horrifying event would be over soon. I didn't have my phone or watch, so I didn't know how long I was hiding there. It felt like I had to have been there for more than 10 minutes. That's when I heard the bigger guy yell out, You idiot! I heard both men running out of the building. I slowly peeked over the ledge and didn't see anybody. I stayed hidden for a few minutes until I was sure I was alone. I finally got up and ran towards the back where I'd left my phone. I immediately called the authorities and my boss. Before I knew it, a middle-aged man was standing in the doorway with a police officer. A brief mix-up ensued as the middle-aged man assumed I was the one trying to rob the store. This middle-aged man was the owner, who got a call from the security company who monitors it. Somehow, the intruders had tripped the alarm when leaving, but not when entering. When the police and owners showed up, I guess I looked pretty guilty. Thankfully, it only took a few moments to clear my name, and I was able to give my side of the story. As far as I know, they never caught those guys. At least, I've never heard so from my boss, or anybody else that the robbers were caught. If I google the incident, it doesn't even really come up, leading me to believe that the investigation just kind of ended or never really got solved. This was a horrible night for me. I assume those men had some familiarity with the store, since they knew exactly what they were doing. If you ever find yourself in a situation like this, sometimes the best thing to do is just stay quiet and stay hidden. Your life is way more important than being a hero. This happened pretty recently, and because of it, I'll be quitting my job at the end of this month. My current job is to deliver papers to homes in the mountains, basically in the middle of nowhere. It's pretty tough because I start work at midnight in order to get all of my deliveries done, and it doesn't exactly pay well either. Still though, it's good to be having any work, especially when you're young. You have your own money, and it's nice. Right. Anyway, like I said, I start at midnight, and I don't finish until the sun starts coming up. Sometimes, in the darker months, the sun doesn't come up at all. Being out in the mountains alone at night can be pretty spooky, as I'm sure you might imagine. I want to share this recent scary experience with you. This happened in winter. I had gotten used to the rhythm of deliveries by that point. It was around winter that the newspaper company I worked for was trying to expand their business. This would mean there would be more work for me. I was excited to earn a bit more money, but over time it became more and more time consuming. Basically, a subscription would come in and then it would be down to me to deliver it to the customer. So, I'm usually riding my bike around with a big map because signal is a no-go in the mountains. I don't mean a pushback, by the way. I mean a really low-quality motorbike, low CCs. The people who buy these subscriptions have the amazing ability to be unfindable somehow. It was never a straightforward task to find their homes. I had one of those subscription jobs on that winter night. I knew the address, and I knew it wasn't going to be easy. There were a few roads through forest areas, and even worse was the fact that some of the roads were very narrow. I could barely even fit my bike along them. I set off and rode my bike right up to the point where the narrow roads began. Since it was winter, I figured it would be safer to just park my bike and deliver the subscription on foot. There was a footpath, after all. There was a post box at the end of the customer's driveway. It was a short distance away from the house. I started down the sloped road towards the post box, and then I froze in my tracks. I could hear the sound of a dog barking. No, not just one dog. It sounded like there were at least two. I thought not much of it, and approached the post box with the subscription in hand. It was still pretty much pitch black out, despite it being early morning. As I approached, I noticed the light go on at the front door. There was an old lady stood outside on the porch. Seeing her gave me a real fright, 
I thought to myself, wow, someone's super eager for the morning paper. I figured that since she was out, I could literally just put the subscription in her hand, so I approached her. I stopped when she started yelling at me. It's right here. I'm delivering the newspaper and your subscription. The boss made us wear a uniform, and we had to wear an ID card around our neck as well. Some customers, especially ones like this who live in remote areas, can be real skeptical of people they don't know. You know, stranger danger and all that. I raised my ID badge, as I assumed she could see me pretty well. You expect me to believe that's proof? She screamed at me. I could see the dogs now, especially the whites of their teeth, as they bared them at me and snarled. The old woman then pulled out a pair of long gardening shears from behind her back and pointed them at me. I instinctively backed away. I just tried to remain as calm as possible. I was wondering if this woman was suffering some kind of disease, maybe something like dementia. If she came at me with those long scissors, I planned on kicking her in the abdomen. I practiced full contact karate. However, she was an old lady, and I didn't know if that would really hurt her badly. I hoped it really wouldn't come to that. I just told her, well, okay then, I'll just leave this here and be on my way. With that, I turned to leave. I didn't get paid enough to deal with this bullshit. I upped my pace. The old lady was still shouting at me from behind. It sounded as if she was getting really riled up. The dogs were really barking at me now. I turned around to look over my shoulder, and I saw her let go of their leashes. She was walking towards me, slashing at the air with her scissors. She wasn't making any sense at all. I couldn't make out a single word she was shouting at me. It was time to run now. I raced up the hill as I heard the dogs chasing behind me. I couldn't believe it. She'd literally released the hounds on me. I ran up the hill as fast as I could. I needed to get back to my motorbike. I got back on my bike, kicked out the stand, and hopped on. I started the engine and had a quick look behind me. I saw the tips of the dog's heads coming up the slope. I pulled away without looking back again. It was really scary to be honest. I think myself incredibly lucky to get out of there without any injuries at all. I mean, it would be a much different story if I had a push bike. Those dogs wanting to bite me. I could tell the old woman looked as if she would have joined in too. I imagined her plunging those large gardening scissors into my gut. I shudder at the thought now. After I delivered the rest of my newspapers and subscriptions, I spoke with my boss and told him about my close call. He decided he would make contact with the customer and see what was going on. I could already imagine him taking the side of the customer immediately. That was just the kind of guy he was. When he checked, however, he found the customer's phone number was no longer in use. He decided to go out there himself and speak to the customer in person. I told him to watch out for the dogs. He said he would let me know how it went when I came back to work the next time. I spoke to him the next day, and he told me he did go out there to meet the customer. He found nothing but an abandoned house, though. He then made contact with the subscription company to find out why someone would want to send a subscription to an empty home. It was at this point we learned the subscription company had fudged the numbers to make our company take their business. They wanted it to look like they had more customers than they actually did. That meant they gave out a couple of random addresses for abandoned homes. That's stupid. So who the hell was that woman with the dogs then? I have no idea. When I think back to how hate-filled her face was, it just gives me the shivers. Hence my resignation from the newspaper company. Anyway, I'm still working till the end of the month, so I hope I don't get sent anywhere near the scissor woman's house. I only have a couple of days left of work. I'm sure it will be fine. Back when I was a student at college, I used to work part-time. I picked up a night shift at a local bar, and I really enjoyed working there. On the night that this took place, an older gentleman was already drinking in the bar when I came in to start my night shift. As soon as he saw me stood behind the counter, he got up from his seat and came over to the bar with a smile on his face. When he approached the bar, he struck up a conversation with me. I knew this guy quite well, 
He was a regular and very quiet. He was usually very nice. We had spoken a few times before and he was alright in my books. Now, I have to say that the content from here on in is somewhat incoherent. If you don't understand what this guy said, then you'll be feeling the exact same as I did at the time. The old man approached me and randomly said the following, From now on, it's China's time. You'll see to whatever's left, won't you? He reached out his hands, both of them, and I in return offered my hands out to him as we joined hands in a sort of strange double handshake. He was smiling so hard it was hard to refuse. To be honest, I don't really like hand touching. I don't know why, it just kind of makes me feel all clammy. I let him know because he seemed to be really enjoying himself. My manager would always say, if they go home smiling, then you've done a really good job. The old man had a big old smile on his face. It looked like he'd probably bought more than a couple of drinks, so for the sake of my job, I endured this. I smiled along and thought to myself, oh great, this guy's so drunk. I glanced over at the table he had come from and noticed something. He had a beer there and some kind of side snack dish. That wasn't unusual, to be honest. What was slightly unusual was the fact that neither of them looked touched or opened. I guess that he wasn't hungry. To be honest, I couldn't really care less as long as he was buying. I was just starting my shift anyway. Shortly after we spoke, the old man headed out the door, and I thought nothing more of it. In the early hours of the morning, my manager at the bar received a call. It was the police calling. Apparently, they had found a body. They had multiple questions. The old man had been found dead. He was lying in a street near an intersection, just a small ways away from our bar. Apparently, he was found quite quickly and taken to the hospital. Unfortunately, there wasn't much they could do for him. He was pronounced dead immediately. His death was apparently somewhat suspicious, and that's why my manager was being contacted. It was evident the man had been struck on the head by something or someone. The old man had receipts in his wallet from our bar. Naturally, the police thought our place would be a good starting point to make their inquiry. The officer asked the manager if he had noticed anything strange about the old man's demeanor, or if he acted differently at all. The manager answered no. I guess he wasn't paying the old man much attention, or didn't speak to him all that much that night. It transpired that the old man had suffered a head injury before he came to the bar. He then interacted with everyone and collapsed soon after he left. That's why he'd been behaving so strangely. I wondered to myself, so when the old man said, you'll see whatever's left, won't you? Did that mean something? The way he smiled will always stay with me. Did he know? Did he know he was going to die? Maybe he knew he had a head injury and was trying to get help in the only way he could. Or maybe he knew there wasn't much time left for him. Maybe he wanted to go to a place that made him happy. Maybe I'm reading too much into this, but those words he said will always stay with me. We were able to notify his next of kin. It's a really good thing we were asked, because he was sort of an enigma in town. Apparently, not that many people knew him. Hopefully, I succeeded with his request in that respect. We toasted his memory on the following night shift, and that was that. This is my sister's friend's story. I found it pretty creepy, so I figured you guys would too. My sister works as a nurse. When she was a student, she was sent to various hospitals to work with other nurses. This was the same for all her other student friends. My sister heard this story when she met up with one of her close friends. She said that even though they were sat in a warm coffee shop when she heard this, she still had chills race up her spine. So, the hospital that my sister's close friend worked at was in a rural location. It wasn't your typical busy hospital. It didn't have that many patients. She was working the night shift on the night this took place, doing her rounds and checking on the patients as usual. There were only a few patients in her ward. They say those long, dark hospital hallways can be quite eerie in the dead of night. My sister and her friend tell me you get used to that kind of thing after a while, though. 
I don't know if I ever could. I'm a bit of a scaredy cat. After doing her rounds, she headed back to the nurse's station to see how her colleagues on the night shift were hanging. She was there updating some of her paperwork and chatting when she heard an alert. When a nurse call button is pressed, it sends an alert to the nurse's station. A patient needed some attention. There was one problem though. The room in which the nurse call had come from was apparently a vacant room that had been empty ever since the patient had passed away in it last week. Is this a prank? One of her colleagues asked. Well, someone pressed the call button, so I guess I better go check it, she replied. She was a little bit scared, of course, but since she was a student nurse, she thought she would show some initiative rather than just be told to do it. She was the youngest and got bossed around the most, so off she went to investigate this call from the empty room. Her heart was pounding in her chest as she walked down that hallway. She had always been terrified by the thought of the paranormal. She went down to the corner room in which the call had come from. She opened the door and stepped inside that dark, unused hospital room. There was no one in there. It was just an empty room as far as she could see. Maybe it was just a malfunction. A ghost in the machine, so to say. It was hard to say what it was. She guessed it could have been a prank, too. Maybe some bored patient started scampering around the ward, then quickly ran back to bed. Maybe the button was broken. It could have been a large number of things. She turned to leave the room and put her hand against the door to push it open. Only it wouldn't budge. It was now locked. How on earth? She began to panic. She started beating her hands against that door with all her strength. Her logical thoughts had gone out the window. Now she was thinking of the paranormal. She knew the call could only come when a button was directly pressed. Something called her into that hospital room, and now that same something didn't want her to leave. One of her colleagues came rushing over to the room she was trapped in and opened it from the outside. My sister's friend was an absolute mess. She was completely petrified. She said she didn't feel alone in that room, like something was hiding in the shadows with her. Hospitals can be pretty scary places when you think about all that goes on in there. I mean, there must be some residual energy trapped in some of the rooms. She requested a transfer to a different hospital after that frightening experience. I wonder what it must have felt like to be trapped in that dark room and unable to get out. 